marketing is, is making a promise. <clears throat> uh, branding is making good on that promise. And you can't make good on that promise if your team can't make good on that promise. All right, welcome to The Boost, conversations with people promoting mental health. And uh, yes, our guest fits that category, but this one's really just so selfish of me. This this podcast could be called Steve has a conversation with his friend. <laughs> and maybe maybe I start a show called Steve has conversations with his friends because we just have so much to say. We have like, and we just chatted for, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes in the green room before this, but this is Micah Jones, a good friend of mine, talented uh, designer, brand strategist. Um, we'll get into what he does at the uh, shameless plug where you talk about yourself for a few minutes. But uh, Micah, it's good to see you here. Thanks, man. You too. It's it's already been a pleasure and we haven't even gotten into it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm just going to I'm just going to start like we started all the podcasts and then, and then we'll get, we'll get into the flow, but, um, let's start with the virtual hug and then the shameless plug. So the virtual hug is tell us somebody or something you're thankful for today, man. Uh, I'm going to be kind of cliche and I'm going to say it's my family. Love my family. Um, I've got two little girls, um, five and 10. Uh, and they're fantastic. And then my wife uh, is just really awesome also and patient. And I have started a lot of businesses and I put her through a lot of <laughs> stress <laughs> through that uh, because some of those businesses have failed. In fact, uh, most of those businesses have failed. Uh, some of them have done really well, but, um, and she's been patient throughout. So, and then also, um, I grew up in Nashville, but, uh, we moved out to Bend, Oregon a couple of years ago and I love this place. It's gorgeous and interesting, um, and small. And we went up to Portland, uh, just a little while ago and Portland is, I think a little smaller than Nashville even. Uh, but being there, we realized that we have become small town folk, which is not what I was expecting. I was like, interstates are terrible because we don't have one here, right? The fastest speed limit we have in Bend is like 55, I think, maybe 65 when you get out of town. So I'm thankful for that. Mm -hmm. Bend is precious. Bend is amazing. What is the industry like there now? Because I was there, I don't know, I would say 15 or 20 years ago. My wife's grandparents lived there for a spell mm -hmm. uh, and it was just gorgeous. Every time we got to visit, um, what's, what's the industry like these days? Well, it seems like, um, there's a lot of tech out here. A lot of people from California, um, a lot of, uh, sort of Silicon Valley stuff, tons of marketing. I made a joke to somebody I was standing in line for, uh, to go see Dune two actually. And I was getting an old fashioned at the theater. Um, which was the best idea. And also this is the first time, no, this is the second time in my life I've ever gone to a movie by myself. And it was, I had a drink. It was awesome. But I struck up conversation with somebody in line and they said, well, what do you do? And I said, oh, I just do what everybody else in this town does. And she goes, landscape architect. <laughs> I was like, oh no, <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, so I guess my exposure to industry has been pretty myopic. Um, uh, but it just seems like a lot of people I talk to are engineers or marketers or, uh, you know, their, their product owners, something like that. So yeah, okay. that's been my experience. Nice. So your family is your virtual hug, your, your daughters, your wife, they've yeah. been with you through thick and thin. Yeah. And that's so clutch. Um, before we get to the shameless plug, which is the last scripted part of this conversation, I want to get to a special segment I call, what is that pink roofed house behind your right shoulder? Man, so I'm in my office that also serves as, as the playroom. So usually, so I've got 
you know, several little houses. And then I've also got an electric drum set, but I took it down so I could lay it down because it was sort of in the way. And so I'll be working. I, I played drums for 15 years, but I'll be working like this and then I'll just turn around and play drums for a little while. And that's just been amazing. I got it for my birthday, which was just a few months ago. My wife got it for me. And when I moved to Bend, when we moved to Bend, I was, I had just turned 40 and moving cross country is a significant thing, especially when you have little kids. And I had never left Nashville. All of my friends had sort of left and then come back and then left. Um, I had never left. I'd been there for 28 years, right? I never lived anywhere else as an adult. And so when we moved out here, it was significant. And I just wanted to be really intentional about it. And so I said, what are the behaviors in relationships that I want to leave behind in Nashville? And what are the behaviors and relationships that I want to take with me or um, sort of re um, investigate, right? And when we moved here, I realized I played drums semi-professionally for a long time. And then I stopped because I was burned out for like five years. Um, I got rid of my drum set and, uh, and then I also used to do MMA boxing and, and jujitsu and stuff for a long time. And then when we moved here, I just said, you know, I, I really feel like I've lost sight of these aspects of my identity that are laying dormant, but are really important to me. And so I've been actively investing my time and resources into um, doing these things again. And it, dude, it's been so life-giving. It's been crazy. And then the habits and behaviors and relationships that were stealing my energy, I just left them, left them behind. And in my mind, I'm like, <clears throat> instead of having that sort of midlife crisis, um, and maybe I'm immature and naive to think that I can avoid that. Uh, but in my mind, I was like, I'm just going to take this head on and, and really be intentional about it. Um, and it's so far, it's served me really well. Mm. I remember when you left Nashville, I forget if it was the, the first time or when you kind of came back and got some more stuff, it was like you were putting in more roots, but there was a party for you and your friends showed up and I didn't know your friends all that well. Um, but I knew you really well, and I was so impressed with the depth of the relationship and the depth of, let's say, love that they had for you. You know, yeah. just uh, it was that was the hardest part other than you, you know, going farther away across the country from me was you uh, was watching that kind of maybe break apart and not knowing like, oh, is this is this going to be good for Micah? Like, look how much he has right here in terms of relationships and then the great unknown of moving to Oregon and not yeah. knowing what that's going to be like in the transition period to get, get set and comfortable. But it sounds like, um, well, not, not to put a bow on anything, but these phrases come into my mind that I need to start writing down more often. Uh, one is the quote from Carl Jung, which is, life begins at 40, everything before that is just research, you know? And, and there That's does seem that. to be like this cadence to our lives of almost uh, in two decade waves, you know, yeah. um, just, uh, you know, total ignorance, <laughs> zero to 20 for me. Yeah. And then thinking, thinking I know a lot and realizing I don't, and then yeah. getting back to that, that trough, and then being like, okay, uh, life begins again. Life is new, actually, in a lot of ways. Um, you know, the age of your kiddos is like, you know, that's that's similar to mine. I've got a nine-year-old, and um, that was definitely a muse that re-entered my life and reawakened some of the the hobbies and passions and some of the folly in my life. You know, some of the things I love, like like drumming for you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate you saying that. I um, was really lucky. Um, I was homeschooled most of my life. Um, and so I was really active in the church and active in music. 
because you don't have, you know, the public school um, to sort of provide community for you. Uh, so I had to proactively find community and uh, try to build it. Um, and that's really hard to do at a young age, but, uh, but I was really lucky. Um, I met some dudes early on and they will be my friends forever, right? Uh, whether I like it or not, it's just one of those, and I like it, but it was one of those things where it's just like, I kind of don't have a choice. Uh, we're in it for the rest of our lives. Um, and I just happen to luck out and, and be friends with some really, really quality people. Um, and it's funny because I've, um, I've sort of rekindled those relationships that you're talking about with those people, because in Nashville, I didn't even realize this. I was stuck and, mm -hmm. um, depressed and, um, anxiety had sort of taken over and I was just numb to everything. And I didn't even know it. And my wife was just like, we have to get the hell out of here. And I was like, no, we can't leave. You know, we have family here. We have friends here. We have a community here. And she's just like, this isn't going well for anybody. We got to get out of here. And I just didn't even, I was just like, fine. Yeah. Like Nashville kind of sucks. Let's just get out of here and see what happens. And so we leave. And then I sort of realized that I was in this state of numbness and mm -hmm. I didn't even know it. Um, but my wife, God bless her. Um, I think she, I think she was following some instincts and, and knew that something was not quite right. So, um, leaving was hard. Um, but through that process, those relationships have sort of been rekindled, which has been really good. And she was the one that was able to see it more clearly than you, you were in it and she was maybe above it or outside it a little bit where she could look into you and your life and see like, Oh man, you're, you're stuck. You're from, you're not, yeah. you're not thriving here. Yeah. Yeah. Big time, big oh. time. And our, our daughter, our 10 year old, um, she's 10 now, um, has had significant anxiety issues her entire life. She started therapy when she was four years old. Um, she started medication when she was, five or six. Um, and this poor girl, uh, I, I've had anxiety, you know, my whole life. Um, I was sick a lot as a kid and my parents thought that maybe it was because I had physical problems. Oh. went to see a lot of doctors and the doctors are just like, he's fine. Um, there's nothing wrong with him. Looking back, it's because my anxiety was so high. I would just get physically sick. Um, and so I've, I've learned, I mean, I, I, I've been reading this incredible book called the mindful body. Um, and it's just saying that our minds have so much control over our bodies, so much more than we even think. Um, and that's exactly what was happening when I was a kid. I was, I think my uh, imagination and creativity is awesome and powerful, but on the flip side, it can be really damaging if it's unchecked, right? Mm. Um, or if I'm in a dark place, right. Um, and I see that in my daughter and my wife also, um, terrible anxiety, uh, her whole life. And we met with a, a child psychologist and she said, um, girls, especially are prone to anxiety, but if both parents had it growing up, then your child is also going to have it seven times like some insane thing where it's just like sh this poor kid didn't stand a chance. Um, I saw uh, Ryan Reynolds being interviewed the other day. And when I hear celebrities talking about mental health, I just kind of roll my eyes most of the time. And I'm just like, that's a cool thing to be talking about to acknowledge that you have mental health problems. Um, but people that really have mental health problems, I think, <laughs> it is not fun to acknowledge. And it's, it's not cool to talk about because it's a struggle and it sucks. Except Ryan Reynolds was saying like, yeah, I have anxiety in it and it really sucks. And I was just like, whatever, dude, like you have an awesome life. But then he started to talk about how that anxiety has actually been kind of nice in some ways because it gives you this self-awareness that most people don't have. 
And when he said that, I was like, oh, I think this guy really struggles with anxiety <laughs> because like when it's, when it's that, when it's debilitating, you really look into yourself a lot of the time and you're stuck in your head a lot of the time. And for people that have uh, creativity as a job, it can be really helpful, especially if, if empathy is a, is an important part of your job. And it is for mine, um, brand strategy and, and user experience. Um, having that anxiety and learning to deal with your really powerful mind that's trying to work against you most of the time, you tend to learn a lot about yourself. And so the good thing about my 10 year old having this crazy anxiety is that she's one of the most self-aware 10 year olds I have ever met in my life. And if we can give her the tools to deal with the darkness of anxiety and the debilitating uh, aspects of anxiety, then she's actually going to end up being a really cool teenager and a really cool adult, right? Because she'll have the words and the framework to describe what's going on and then to uh, sort of medicate or self-medicate or self-soothe. Mm -hmm. But then she has that good thing, which is I know how my brain works and I know how other people's brains work. Maybe, right. If I know myself really well, then I already have, um, a decent, uh, first step in knowing other people really well. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the, the inflection point that we've been going through, I think the last five to seven years is really interesting to that note. Um, I saw Michael Phelps, uh, at a conference talk about his own struggles. And I came away similarly impressed uh, just with the this pretty simple idea that he was on the very top of the world, mm -hmm. crushing it. And actually, I just watched him on some Instagram clip the other day when he's cheering on his, uh, his uh, relay partner, closing it out in the Olympics and like barely out touching the other team. And he just freaks out and you just can't help but look at him and his unique physique he's like an adonis god of swimming you know and here he is struggling and um and it just kind of woke me up uh mm. because yeah every yeah uh because it's also gotten kind of cool to talk about it or to talk like you're talking about it you know, also, so the, the pendulum can go very far. Um, you know, you see it on TikTok where it's like a lot of right. self-diagnosis, right. a lot of trauma talk, uh, which I can't diagnose, right. uh, but it certainly feels like the pendulum has swung, but where people are right now in this moment reminds me of this Marie Curie quote uh, which is applicable to today. She was talking about something different, but she was saying now is not the time for fear. Now is the time for m more education, like more mm -hmm. awareness. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's what we're walking through. I can't put it on COVID's shoulders. I feel like it was a bigger tidal wave than COVID, uh, but that certainly was maybe a forced function um, or a catalyst. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're probably right. I mean, the amount of um, marriages that um, ended uh, through COVID, it, it, crazy, just staggering to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think you're right. I don't think it's just COVID, but uh, COVID did give us an opportunity to do a lot of um, self-reflection and um, being a lot more inward focused. And so maybe you know, we had to come to terms with our uh, loneliness and unhappiness that we typically try to ignore. I don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah. Yeah. I remember the line, uh, despite all my rage, I'm still just a rat in a cage Smash at some pockets. point running through my head and feeling like I was like a, a tiger trapped in a zoo, uh, mm -hmm. display mm -hmm. inside a house, uh, not in my natural element. And, uh, and how that impacted me in my life, you know, mm -hmm. uh, there's, uh, 
yeah, it's like it's like before you before you bet everything on safety and security and home, you know, like look at animals in the wild and look at animals in the zoo and see who's happy, see who's thriving, you know, but we were forced into it. Like it was like, yeah. you don't really have an option. You know, the whole culture, the whole community is, is basically moving this one direction. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> You know, I've done all these personality tests and I'm because I and we can we can get into this because we're going to because I can't help myself. But here we go. Um, branding. <laughs> I'm a brand strategist. Um, I love I love the idea of brand, the concept of brand. Um, and we're we're in. The, let's do the shameless plug. Hey, let's do the shameless plug. We're doing it. Right okay. Now. Go OK. Yeah, here we go. Uh, I've been doing uh, design and creative direction for 20 years. I um, got my start in print from print, moved into web early on, um, creative director at various agencies around the Nashville area. Um, and a bunch of years ago, I started to get sick of designing for the sake of designing and, uh, trying to make clients look cool without knowing why or how, or what I'm supposed to be doing exactly. Um, and I met a guy named Lindsey Jameson, um, absolutely brilliant brand strategist, and he's been at it for a long time. Also, incredible drummer. Um, he and I and British, him. right? Isn't he British? And or... British, yeah. So and his name, just listen to him and believe him. Yeah. yeah. And his his yeah. name is like a poem, Lindsey Jameson. It's like yeah, he's like, oh, thanks for uh, thanks for coming off tour with Fleetwood Mac to help me with my branding <laughs> problem. Right. Or... No, I mean. He played with Ben Folds for a long, like he's just, yeah, he, he's incredible. Um, uh, but I, I, uh, helped start a, an organization called the uh, Nashville independent business Alliance. And, um, it was at a time when Nashville was really changing a lot of, I, it seemed like, uh, local government was using the reputation and equity that Nashville boutique independent businesses um, were developing and they're, they were leveraging that to invite large national chain stores into Nashville. Mm -hmm. And it pushed these independent businesses out. It was disgusting. It was gross. Um, I have tons of examples of that. Um, and so uh, Talisha Cobb, a woman who, who owned a, a couple of businesses in Nashville saw that happening. She said, we need to do something about this and tapped me um, to help her get this vision off the ground, which is fantastic. Wow. But I knew that I was in way over my head and I invited Lindsay Jameson into it. Cause I was like, this feels like branding. Like, I'm not sure what that even means, but this feels like brand. And through that process, he and I became uh, really good friends. Um, and I learned the power of branding and then I just took it and ran with it. Um, and now I still do design. I still do creative direction. I still do um, user experience design with a focus on conversion rate optimization and search engine optimization, all really important things. Yeah. Um, I, I did my very first job of screen printing and I still do that. Right. Um, because I want to engage in any, any sort of visual representation of values that a brand might have. Right. And so I have language now uh, to explain why uh, we are going to go with the color yellow for a particular brand. Right. Um, and I uh, absolutely love to walk clients through the process of uh, discovering what the organization is and why they exist and what they stand for. Um, and I've been doing that for a bunch of years now. Um, but one of my favorite things about this concept of brand is that it doesn't apply to just organizations. It applies to everything in my opinion. And these are some thoughts that I've been thinking about. I've been wanting to call you about this actually, Steve, uh, to get your take because you, um, are sort of a, a brilliant, uh, brand strategist and marketer and uh, creative, uh, in your own right. And so I'd love to have these conversations with you because you, uh, you come at it from this sort of academic approach. Uh, and I love that, but brand, in my opinion, um, is sort of, it extends into people. 
I'm, I'm a brand and you're a brand and the things that I'm doing, I'm doing for a reason, whether I know it or not, whether it's, it's conscious or not, I'm telegraphing values that I have, right. In the hopes that I may attract people to me, that I may build community, but I'm not selling anything monetarily. I'm not looking for people to give me money for a service. I'm, but I am selling something. If you want to take a commerce approach to it, I want people to buy into my brand. So I guess in a way there's some kind of exchange, but really that exchange is time and attention from them is on money, but I'm telegraphing values to attract people that are similar to me. I've got lots of tattoos, the clothes that I wear, the way I style my hair, the words that I use, the way that I name my children, right? These are all things that I'm, I'm doing, and I do it pretty intentionally, but whether it's intentional or not, it's happening. Um, and so that idea of brand it, is just exhilarating to me for some reason. And I think part of it is because we all struggle with identity. I don't care who you are. You've struggled with identity at some point in your life. I guarantee it. And if you haven't, God bless you. That is awesome. Right. But it's hard to know where you fit in, especially as you're growing up when you're a kid. Um, and so knowing why you do the things that you do, knowing what's important to you is just an incredible experience coming to these conclusions. Like, wait a minute, I hate that music and I hate that music because whatever it may be. And so for me, it's been life giving and, uh, and just really awesome to explore brand from a personal standpoint. So I've been actually pulling on or, or bringing on clients, um, just to do personal branding. It's awesome. Hmm. Cool. What? So you mentioned values, you mentioned drawing people toward us mm -hmm. or yourself, uh, level set on what, how do you define brand? Like, with those things, like, how would you describe it to a client succinctly? What brand is? And okay. Everybody, this, this is what I'm struggling with right now. Everybody loves to talk about Jeff Bezos, right? And his quote, brand is what everyone says about you and you're not in the room. I don't know that he actually said that, but people say he says that I will use that in my workshops because that's a really great way for people to wrap their head around it really quickly. But I don't think that's quite it. I think that's a piece of it. Mm -hmm. I think that's more of um, brand positioning. I, that's more reputation in my mind. Uh, Marty Neumeyer, who is um, a, a sort of a legendary brand strategist, um, he says, um, and, and I've also used this in my workshops, your brand isn't what you say it is, it's what they say it is. He's also not wrong, right? We all know this. You don't own your brand. They own your brand, right? Um, I feel like collectively, when I used to do workshops six, seven years ago, I'd say, what do you think brand is? And they're like, your website. And I'd say, you're wrong. Uh, no. Back <laughs> in the day, everyone thought your brand was your logo. Well, I think there's been enough education now that people know that your brand isn't your logo, right? Uh -huh. And that you don't hold your brand, they hold your brand and it's up to you to influence them. So you got to make sure you still tell your story, right? Right. Uh, internal clarity. That's how you, uh, sort of make sure that that story is being told accurately. Uh, and then hopefully that catches on. So you're trying to influence them, uh, to get the right idea about your brand. That still bothers me. <laughs> All of the things I'm saying, I've said it a thousand times, I feel like. Um, and I just don't think it's enough because what I'm, what I'm wrapping my head around now. Oh, and some of my favorite parts about branding, um, uh, is internal culture, organizational health. Um, if you don't have that right, um, then <clears throat> you don't have the ability to make good on your promise. So, um, marketing is, is making a promise, <clears throat> uh, branding is making good on that promise. And you can't make good on that promise if your team can't make good on that promise, right? So organizational health to me is major. Talk about um, uh, mental health, man. I mean, we spend so much time at our jobs 
And if it, if it's draining, if it sucks, I had a boss who was an alcoholic and an abuser and, um, horrible, horrible things happen. Like he threw a chair and he threw it so hard in the office that it broke through the drywall and was sticking out of the drywall halfway. I should not have had to be in that environment. That was one of my first jobs. I was, you know, late teen, early twenties, I think. Um, that's toxic. That's, that's beyond toxic. Like I think toxic culture is a, <clears throat> it's kind of a buzzy term. Um, and I don't think people sort of need to be in that environment anymore. <clears throat> so organizational health to me is such an important part about, uh, branding. Um, and it shouldn't be overlooked. I'm sort of rambling now because I, I love to talk about this, this stuff. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry. Yeah. Don't be sorry. Um, I'll take a break. Yeah. My, my, my ideas about brand, uh, probably heavily influenced by what you've taught me over the years and still continues to change. So it's interesting to hear you say, um, marketing is, wait, you said, uh, uh, branding is making good on the promise. Marketing is the promise. I think so. I think marketing, you are, you are, you are claiming that you can do a thing, right? And, and for the marketers out there, we're talking about value propositions, right? You're proposing that, that you will provide value, but if you don't actually provide value, um, then, then there's mistrust there. And, and I think a lot of people are wary of marketers because of that very thing, mm. but branding is actually making good on that promise. Because you're saying, okay, we're going to do this thing. And then people engage with the brand and then you actually deliver on that promise. You actually do that thing. That feels like branding to me. Mm -hmm. But I think the definition of brand, because I think organizational health and, and this idea of brand strategy, because it's the same for organizations, uh, nonprofit or for-profit, uh, churches, um, government, and, and people, individuals, I think they all essentially subscribe to the same things. I think the definition of brand could be um, anything that requires investment from someone else to exist. Yeah. I just made that up. Yeah. But that's what it feels like to me. And it doesn't mean money, right? No, no. It's like, a, and this is going to be a little bit tongue in cheek, but maybe there's like truth in the humor. The thing that I think is going to be funny. It's going to be really funny now that I build it up. <laughs> uh, no, there's this, uh, it's the root. It's just like the root of branding. Like where'd this word come from? And this is not a new idea for anybody who's in branding, but it's like, it's like cows like us do things like this is kind of like the take on the Seth Godin quote, people like us do things like this. So you have a herd of cows, um, hyper tied to incentives of, you know, of survival. And these cows over here get branded with the double, the double X bar. And that says, those are Kathy's cows and Kathy, Ka Kathy's cows are the best most marbled beef you can find. And so you put a mark on them and that brand tells everybody it's a signal. So mm -hmm. I think we got, I think we tried to wag the dog for a while with like, Oh, the brand is the logo mark because it was very close, but it was like, it was mistaking the, the, the meaning for just the medium. You know, it was like, right. well, the logo is part of the branding, but all the logo does is it signals that cows like us do things like this. Right. And it's almost like getting into a party, you know, are you dressed the part to get into the party? Well, if you're going to the Met Gala and you have board shorts on and flip flops, you know, probably not going to get into that party. Mm -hmm. And I think there's deep roots in survival mode, really. Um, we have, you know, you have tattoos that gets you into a certain club 
around the world that I can't join because I don't have tattoos. I can't join that club. Sometimes I really want to. Sometimes I'm happy in my own club that doesn't have tattoos. But it's about survival, really, at the end of the day. So, yeah, maybe you and I are not changing money right now, but we're certainly changing currency and energy or energy in a current form, which is energy directed a certain way, Mm -hmm. which is money. That's all money is. It just happens to be also dollar bills and some governments print it and some governments use clamshells. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. N- nicely put. Um, yeah. Like I said, this is just a thing that I've been struggling with. It's funny because creators, I think that has changed things a lot. And, and still to this day, brand is applied to businesses. Um, you know, um, I can't remember what Seth Godin says about brand, but it's long and it's just so Seth Godin the way he, he does it. But, um, but a lot of people say like, you're, you're, you're trying to, um, sort of add an an emotional component, um, to your, your product or whatever. Um, so that there's that emotional link, um, so that you sell more. And that really bothers me because we're, and maybe this is just millennial, of me, maybe the millennial of me is, is really coming out, but, um, I don't just want to say that I make a great product. I also want to say I'm, I exist because I, I believe in something. Right. And so, uh, if, a, if an organization is like, we just want to sell more, whatever we want to sell more of these little houses that are crazy expensive, by the way, <laughs> and especially the, um, the calico critters. Oh my gosh, those are so <laughs> expensive. <laughs> the calico critters. Yeah, when you were telling the story about your um your the boss who threw the chair, I was gonna say like it was the most unfortunate part was that it was at an American girl doll store. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yeah. The chair was a lot smaller actually. Yeah, we should get into toy design. That's what we should yeah. do. I mean, shoot. But it's it's interesting because it, I, I want to, it just like all these millennials, I don't want to just buy a product. I want to buy into what the brand stands for. Right. And so a lot of the time, um, what I'm doing with clients, uh, is just trying to, uh, get them to understand that they uh, should probably exist for a, a purpose more than just making money. And they typically do. I remember I was leading a brand strategy workshop for, a um, up in like Albany or something. I don't remember where I was. Um, and we were working with a manufacturer. Um, and when we started to really get into the reason why the company existed, it took a long time to get to this point, but he finally said, my dad was let go when I was a kid, the plant shut down and, and everybody lost their jobs and it threw the community into a great depression. Right. And it was horrible. And so he wanted to create the plant, the local plant, so that he could create jobs for these people. So they didn't have to go through what he went through, but it took hours for him to finally realize that I'm doing this. I'm, I, I have picked this industry. I've picked this, this particular product to create, um, not just to make money, but, but, but because, you know, I grew up and I, I had a traumatic experience. And I think that can exist a lot of time. Some brands just exist to make money and that's fine. Uh, but oftentimes there's a deeper reason whether we know it or not. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating that that company in Albany was sprung from a trauma. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I think I have, I can't say it's trauma or not, but I can, I have similar drivers for why I'm passionate and effective in the work I do in certain cases when I uh, am in a position of ownership or agency, or I get to call the shots, you know. Um, It's not because I love calling shots, it's because uh, I've just seen enough of the games run to know who wins in a certain definition of winning. Mm -hmm. And it's risk, you know, I'm not, Mm -hmm. not saying I've picked the optimal path 
or that I know what I'm doing all the time, but it is a result of growing up, you know, with certain means and, yeah. and seeing that it's, it's the Kanye West line. It's, uh, it's money's not everything, not having it is, you know, mm -hmm. and it can, it can, if you don't have that hierarchy foundation, it can be difficult not to say that's the way not to say, well, more money is the path, but it is to say that money can buy you meals money can mm -hmm. buy you, you know, lots of things that are, some of those are important to survival. Um, so how do you, I don't know, how do you do those things? I don't know where I'm going with all of that, except to circle back to the idea that I'm not saying, oh, well have some trauma. And then years later, you'll be a successful entrepreneur. It's that, it's that we're resilient yeah. up into a point, you know, like there's this study on adverse childhood experiences. And again, not to say we're not resilient, but you have six or more of those in your early years. Um, and you have a very, you have a shorter life, you know, like by mm -hmm. decades. Um, it's just the math on those numbers. Um, so, I forget if you said it in the green room or here, but just the, I think in here, the power of a, the power of family and people around you loving you yeah. uh, as the antidote to loneliness or the antidote to our own misery that we find ourselves in, you know, the dark side of the moon sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Well, there's a lot more I wanted to talk with you about. Um, I know you got to go. So, um, we're going to, we're going to launch, uh, we're going to launch a new podcast called conversations <laughs> with Micah. <laughs> what? No way. Micah and Steve riffing for a long time. Yes. Yes. Just join if you want. <laughs> yeah. It can be an open call. Like uh, yeah. up to two other people could join. <laughs> <laughs> Man, well, thanks for having me on here. Um, it's been an absolute blast. Um, I feel like I rambled a lot. Um, you really did. I was going to tell you that later. Yeah, no, but thanks. Not, no, we might as well get it out now. Not as much as me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. I was like, but I only did that because you did it. I was like, oh, we're, oh, there's a rambling podcast. Here we yeah, are. I'm sorry. I really, I really yeah. set the tone. We'll play rambling man at the beginning of this, just as like a, a ha ha funny joke for us. Um, uh, Easter egg, though, if you're listening this far in, I'm just going to drop it here that Micah has helped us with designing uh, a new brand and, and a new logo mark and everything for a company we're launching called Turn Events. And uh, you'll see Micah's handiwork and his brain work soon. Um, mm -hmm. But that's totally exciting. And we're loving it, Micah. We just like just can't wait to play put it everywhere. Oh man. It's, it's been my pleasure. What a fun thing to do. And, and we didn't even talk about that strategy or, or those values that you have informing your visual identity. Right. Uh, but Steve, you and I speak the same language. So it was just, I don't know. It was just kind of easy to be on the same page, frankly. It was so, easy. Um, yeah. From our side too. Yeah. It's been super fun. All right, dude. Um, great to see you. Great to talk. Um, let's chat soon, recorded or not. Um, but thanks for yeah. coming on the boost. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Hey, thank you, man. Appreciate it. Yep. All right. Have a good one. See ya.